I sent you uh, a few, uh, just just a few of uh, the sense of the uh, questions uh, and uh, the the interest I had. I'm actually also writing a book on participation, digital participation uh, online, uh, trying to understand what happened, what is happening uh, around the world uh, in the various movements that. Uh, uh, pledge for uh, their, their new rights or pledge for uh, whatever battle they, they bring in forward. Um, one of the topics I wanted to understand with you uh, is uh, what happened to the Sunflower Movement once you went to government? Is this uh, a transition from protest? You actually, I, I saw you went to Parliament, occupying the Parliament. Uh, I think your father also was uh, in the Tiananmen Square. Uh, so you you are a history of protest, and now you are governing uh, a country mm, uh, of demonstration, 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 demonstration. Yeah. Okay, uh, what is this uh, uh, transition? Uh, how does this transition work, and uh, how what were the uh, steps that uh, uh, were were passed uh, through in this transition? Yeah, uh, I emphasize demonstration because I view it as a demo, not as in taking anything down, but as in setting up a new model that works at least for some structural cases better than the top-down model of old. Uh, and so demonstration in the sense of um, a demo version of a software rather than as in opposing something. And that is still what I am doing. Uh, I'm the digital minister working with the government, but not for the government, with the people, but not for the people. So my role has not changed. I'm still in this kind of Lagrange point between governments on one side and movements on the other, making sure that they understand each other's viewpoints without getting captured into the gravity well of any particular side. Or if we shorten to very simple forwards, uh, I take all the sides. Okay, well, that's a, a good position, I guess, to uh, translate what people uh, what movements and what governments uh, needs or wants uh, or, mm -hmm. or can have. And uh, so that, that's an excellent spot, I guess, to to also view things that uh, to mm -hmm. are happening. So what has happened to the Sunflower movement or mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the Gov movement that I G0 zero mo G0 V zero Gov movement. zero, yeah. yeah Gov, Gov zero is still very active, extremely active. Uh, and also a lot of the modern day infrastructure for politics, for two examples, um, to counter the pandemic with no lockdown. People in Gov Zero created um, hundreds of maps uh, to display availability of medical masks so that everybody have plenty of supply uh, of those masks in a very fair fashion. Um, in other uh, issue, the infodemic, which sometime come with the pandemic, but in Taiwan's case, it's before the pandemic, we already have a infodemic, a disinformation crisis. Um, again, it's the Gov Zero people that created the co-facts system that makes sure people can report uh, misinformation or disinformation on even end-to-end -end encrypted channels, such as WhatsApp, uh, in Taiwan it's called Line. Um, and so that the trending misinformation, once that have a R value above one, that is to say when it's about to go viral, uh, people can fact check it and counter it using humorous clarifications like humor over rumor. Uh, and so this COFAX system is a lot like the quarantining system uh, in fighting the pandemic so that people can get alerted when there is a trending disinformation. So just these two uh, shows how GovZero has been so active in countering the pandemic with no lockdown and countering the infodemic with no takedown. So how is actually uh, GovZero organizing itself? Uh, are they all people from Taiwan or are there people from all over the world that uh, are tackling these uh, these issues? 
Yeah, it's all over the world. It, it's literally just a uh, hashtag, right? So there is G0V.it uh, as well. Um, and you can find G0V uh, in all sorts of different movements. It's basically a reimagination of any digital service from the government you don't like or haven't been done yet, something that GOV or that GOV.TW or that GOV.IT, you can reimagine it as something that G0V. That TW or that IT or whatever. Um, and so if you uh, join the Slack channel, for example, of join the G0V TW, then you can very easily find people of all different jurisdictions, um, Taiwanese, but also uh, other people. At the moment, it's almost 9,000 people uh, on the general channel uh, right now. Uh, in the COVID 19 channel, um, there is 647 people uh, working on counter COVID uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so this is basically just a way to meet uh, people online and then go on to meet them uh, in the real world also because there's constant activities such as the GovZero Summit, uh, which is again an international event uh, in Tainan uh, this time. Uh, and I'm just posting you the agenda for the GovZero Summit so you can see the diversity of participants as well as the topics. Great, thank you. Uh, so, uh, do you think there's this, uh, still something that you uh, should be still opening up from governments? I've seen you've done a lot of things, a lot of debating, a lot of uh, uh, cracking out the, the data of uh, the government. Uh, do you think there are still some steps you should be uh, uh, addressing in Taiwan that are still not, uh, uh, are still not done? Yeah, definitely. Uh, two days from now, uh, we are set to meet in a multi-stakeholder forum of half the people in the public sector and half the people as citizens uh, to ratify our open government plan for the next three years. Uh, and so uh, basically the topics uh, that's going to be ratified uh, two days from now is going to be our vision for the next uh, three years uh, and for what we are going to go through as a democratic polity to open up even more uh, part of ourselves. Now, of course, because it's not yet ratified, uh, take everything I say with a grain of salt because, you know, it may be changed <laughs> by the multi-stakeholder forum. <laughs> uh, but but there's, there's already uh, some general themes uh, emerging uh, from there. And I think this is important uh, to see the general themes, uh, not just uh, individual issues to be opened. Um, for example, there's a lot of uh, pressure now uh, on the legislation to also open the process of the parliament, not just the administration. So there's another task force comprised of legislators across all the four major parties in the parliament right now that is not related to us in the administration, but also working to ratify their open parliament plan, um, hopefully on the same day uh, as we do. So, so that is uh, one part of it. Now on the administration side, uh, there's roughly speaking um, about, I don't know, 18 or so different commitments uh, across all the different ministries. And some of them uh, are, of course, what you have already heard, uh, the open data, um, the open API endeavors, uh, and making the National Center for High-Speed Computation, um, make sure that there's a civil IoT system for GPU intensive computation, uh, strengthening uh, digital privacy, uh, and also personal data protection. Uh, these are, of course, what we have already known, like freedom of information and so on. There's ones that are less uh, known internationally. For example, the e-collecting for national referenda, that's new. Uh, for example, the uh, youth participation, systemic participation uh, in all public sector um, endeavors, even before they turn into adults, uh, that's, that's new. Uh, uh, placemaking, regional revitalization, like now on the township level, to do open government, not on the national, but on a very local scale, that's new. Uh, labor union, revitalizing labor unions, using open government principles, that's new. Uh, and also integrating open government into the new curriculum of basic education, 
that's new. And also, there's another branch about inclusion, for example, about gender uh, equality, uh, about new immigrants who don't have voting rights, but nevertheless are affected by public policy. Um, indigenous nations, uh, that's another uh, part of that branch. Uh, also, the Hakka uh, uh, people, uh, that's also another promise. Now, finally, on the accountability side, of course, we did a lot on campaign donation and campaign expenditure, uh, but uh, there's always more to be done, especially on the local level, which is less transparent. And also open procurement, there's the open contracting partnership on it, whistleblowing, that's another part, uh, as well as the um, like anti-money laundering uh, benefits corporation stuff, and also for the more spiritual um, institutions, uh, how to make um, our relationships to them more uh, mutually transparent uh, without um, offending their sensibilities. Uh, that's new. Uh, and so that's uh, that were the core promises uh, that we're going to discuss two days from now. Okay, so uh, a lot of uh, things. I was uh, uh, particularly interested in the uh, uh, referenda uh, mm -hmm. e, e campaigning e -collecting. or e collecting mm -hmm. the the signatures. I guess mm -hmm. uh, that's right. you, you mean. Yeah, yeah. I I've seen that that's happening in various countries. Uh, uh, around Europe also, and mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, working very, uh, very well. So that's mm -hmm. certainly something that uh, is uh, is a good direction, at least for uh, for Italy in uh, in the future, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I am, um, and uh, analyzing how participation actually works uh, online, and uh, I saw that uh, often people get excited for new things, but on the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, they they get uh, exhausted or they they uh, they they go uh, they go around and they uh, and uh, they they mm -hmm. they leave the project. So how do you mm -hmm. get people uh, enthusiastic uh, in the long run mm -hmm. uh, in getting involved continuously? Do you have like recruiting recruiting really young people? Mm. Yeah. So so, so it's the that's, youngsters. That's, uh, yeah, it's long, the youngsters. Long laughter. Yeah, the, the, right, that's right. Um, on the participation platform, join the GOV, the TW, the most active ones are people around 50, 15 or 16 years old, and then people around 50 or 60 years old. Uh, and maybe both, you know, have more time, uh, simply. Uh, but also, um, both are uh, more inspired by longer term thinking. Uh, for people between those two age groups, they think more about um, maybe five years from now. But if you are a 15 years old or if you are a 65 years old, you can think about 30 years from now uh, or 50 years from now. Um, one side because you know they're they're on the business end of climate change. The other side because they want something like a positive legacy uh, for their next generations. And so these longer time thinking sustain the participation online. Okay, excellent. Yes. Uh, so uh, people with a longer future will think uh, f further away and uh, with uh, more uh, people that uh, they, they uh, love, uh, they, they want to a, a better world for them. So I guess that's, uh, uh, that's the, the meaning of that. Uh, I, I saw that uh, you have uh, created a lot of participation uh, uh, arenas or places or uh, discussion, uh, debates, uh, uh, places. Uh, do you have ever a minimum level of participation that uh, tells you that uh, that system has worked? Uh, because often maybe a s single system has uh, a, f a few ten, uh, tens of people, uh, others uh, a few hundreds and maybe others millions of people. But is there any minimum limits of participation that will say the, the result of that participation is a good participation? Uh, three people. <laughs> yeah, because three people, then uh, you can find synergies. Yeah. So that's the minimum. So yeah, between two it's people, it's a negotiation it's or a good, partnership, good, good but, but it's not called participation, right? Uh, to participate, you need to bring at least uh, one uh, different perspective from a uh, two-person uh, relationship. Two, two people, we, we call it a, a relationship, maybe. But three people, that's participation. So uh, one of the topics that uh, often gets uh, uh, 
uh, taking out is uh, if there's too few uh, people participating, it will not be representative of the other people that haven't participated. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, is a topic that uh, is often uh, tied to the result that comes out of that debate or that participation. Mm -hmm. If you if you talk about uh, the future of taxis or uh, mm -hmm. the future of Airbnb, mm -hmm. I, I saw you then. And only three people debate. came. Yeah, uh, and and then what happens? Right. Uh, I think uh, what's important is to make sure that these tools are just setting the agenda for future discussions. In this sense, uh, in design thinking terms, they're just a discovery of various positions and the definition of common values of those different positions. Nothing more, nothing less. Uh, but too often the participation is seen on the second diamond, which is developing solutions and delivering on those solutions. In which case, of course, you need to have more people and more binding power. Uh, but if this is just about let's brainstorm and find what we all feel about UberX, then three people is, is good. Uh, so people discover a little bit more, they listen more, and that's good. So every step of participation is a good step towards uh, uh, what I saw uh, one of the, your slides in a presentation, you, you called it hacktivism. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that uh, the, 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 the place we should uh, tend to uh, arrive? Mm -hmm. I, I saw you actually uh, uh, did uh, a journey from activism mm -hmm. to hacktivism. From clicktivism. From, from clicktivism. Oh, the, the beginning yes. is called clicktivism, literally sending only one bit of information. Uh, so like, that's the one bit, <laughs> right? Uh, and but it's, it's something, but it's just one bit. Uh, compared to that, voting is better because when you vote uh, for a local city councilor or vote for a legislator, you are at least sending maybe three bits of information. But still, it's not much more. Right? So uh, what we are saying essentially is to increase the bandwidth of democracy so that people can participate day to day, sharing more bits of information, especially their genuine feelings and things like that. And what we did here is just to make sure we can listen at scale. Previously, people could not listen at scale. So one cannot have a conversation with tens of thousands of people demonstrating, but still arrive to a rough consensus quickly. But now with assistive intelligence, we increasingly have this capability. Of course, it's a force for good when it's pro-social. It's a force for not so good uh, if it's for polarizing and manipulating uh, people's ideas into ideologically opposite things. I mean, this can be used both ways, but the capability is there. There's no denying that. These tools are creating a new world of what I call digital citizenship. I'm actually advocating around the concept of these tools creating new rights. I was mm -hmm. last, year, last year at the UN talking about these new rights that are emerging. Uh, do you, uh, you've used a lot of tools, you've uh, done the presidential hackathon, the mm -hmm. VTI one debating, mm -hmm. the exploring mm -hmm. the government mm -hmm. data with the uh, Gov0. Mm -hmm. uh, so right. you've been exploring a lot of uh, ways of getting people involved. Do you see mm -hmm. any of these uh, tools creating new rights? Do you mm -hmm. see new rights emerged? Uh, that have emerged in Taiwan, for example. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think broadband as a human right uh, is really like for the past four years. Uh, that's been a real uh, investment into getting all places in Taiwan, even top of Taiwan, to get 10 megabits per second uh, both ways, actually, for just 16 euros per month, unlimited data. Uh, that's called broadband as human rights. Um, and it requires a lot of investment, as you would uh, imagine. But the end result is that uh, during the COVID, um, education, um, healthcare, and all that didn't suffer, right? We actually grew the GDP uh, by 2.5% or something uh, this year uh, because there is broadband everywhere, including in the pharmacies. Uh, so it actually became cheaper for people to. Um, 
take their national health card, go to a local pharmacy, which, which always has a fiber optic line, more than 90% do, uh, to the national health database, get a ration mask, and go to a clinic for a full diagnosis. And still, that is cheaper than getting a drive through test in other countries. Um, and so this um, obviously has good health benefits uh, that we can see this year, but also more importantly, it makes sure that people are not left out when there is a new participation methodology. Otherwise, we will be sacrificing these people. Yes, I, I you, you now talked about broadband, so access to internet. Uh, I actually think there's other two things uh, that uh, are the basic rights to access this uh, digital citizenship, which is digital e education, knowing right. how to use these tools and yes. what, uh, what you can use, and uh, digital ID to get recognized mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. for your rights to be mm -hmm. able to exercise mm -hmm. them online. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh -huh. do, you, do you think these are the... Uh, the three basic rights, or do you think there are I, other rights? I don't or? think in the term of literacy, in our basic education curriculum, because broadband both ways is a human right, literacy doesn't work because uh, it assumes a one way like radio or television communication so that you can understand the information that's pushed to you. But now with bi-directional broadband as human rights, all the primary schoolers are also media workers. So what we build is not just literacy, but competence. We talk about media competence, digital competence, which is the ability to produce uh, information and data, to curate uh, data and wisdom, hopefully, uh, and then also to hack, meaning that you can change uh, the technology to fit the way you would like to use it. And these are active participatory um, competence. It's not just about education or literacy. So what do you think are the tools that actually worked best in, in all your history of partic digital participation? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, well, definitely the World Wide Web. The, the, sorry? The World, the World Wide, Wide Web. Web. Yeah, Web. Uh, okay, that in general terms. I was uh, thinking uh, the, the tools that uh, you created, like, uh, for example, the presidential hackathon, the debating on Vitae One, or the uh, opening the data uh, with the Gov Zero or other uh, ways you've actually hacked the the politics in uh, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I said World Web uh, anticipating this uh, question because um, the World Web uh, has this open nature that all the website you can see, you can also view source. Meaning that if you don't like a system, how it's done, like if you don't like how presidential hackathon is done, you can view source uh, and fork that website and make it better. And, and this is important because we cannot anticipate all the needs of the people. All we can anticipate is that people would want to fork the governmental digital services. And this is the core insight of GovZero in that forking the government is not just possible, it's fun. So people could uh, reimagine their digital services, more than 100 different versions of the same digital service. Uh, previously, in a top-down uh, regime, it would be called wasteful, right? Because you're basically using taxpayer money to cater to 100 different uh, special um, visualizations, the um, 20 national languages, uh, maybe uh, for chatbots, for VR, for all sorts of different ways. But if this the people themselves uh, wishing to uh, present the interaction and information in that particular way, then they should have the freedom to do so. And to enable that uh, requires a open web rather than other technologies that go through the internet without the possibility to be forked. Okay, so opening up the government and the government data and the government's maybe uh, tools or uh, whatever can be uh, opened up of the government it is the is the thing that has uh, engaged most and you, you definitely happiest. definitely you can just view yeah. source and then see all the apis that comprise this particular website uh, and this also enabled people to reverse procure 
the government, like they make a really compelling visualization, but they don't have one key piece of data. They can then order the government to build that data or to update it with a higher frequency, which is essentially treating the government as a vendor, right? So this is very interesting because I call it people, public, private partnership, meaning that a social sector uh, acts first and then the public sector and then the economic sector. Yes, that's a, a very interesting uh, perspective as it's uh, the, the people, the, the social sector, as you're saying now, that should be the, the initial force that uh, actually then changes things. Mm -hmm. uh, and they need the tools to, to be able to do that, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, often uh, are not available. And once mm -hmm. they are available, mm -hmm. things actually change. Right. The so, public sector should provide those tools is what I'm saying. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, that's uh, uh, okay. Well, um, do you feel so? There's new rights today in Taiwan that uh, are enabled thanks to technology and digital participation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think these rights are partially realized now. Uh, well, our basic education curriculum is really new, like it's new as of the last two years. So obviously, it has not yet reached all age groups. Similarly, the broadband as a human right, um, although I think we have 99% or so uh, of residential uh, coverage now, still doesn't extend uh, to the most rural or the most remote of the places. And even if they do, it's uh, not guaranteeing that there's sufficient amount of digital competence uh, companions to make sure that the people there have uh, enjoy access uh, to those rights. Uh, we do have a national ID for healthcare. But there's no other um, national ID uh, widely used for pretty much anything else um, electronically. Uh, but that's OK, because for the pandemic, we well use the health IC card extensively and so on. So I, I would say it's all there, but it's not 100 percent. We're still working toward those. So the next step is the digital ID. Uh owned by everyone so they can actually recognize themselves for any service that the state can give or there's already the citizens digital certificate so we already have a pki enabled secure id it's just that maybe one quarter of people actually use it uh, we're in a similar place as Japan, uh, where the, for, for the my number in Japan and the citizen digital certificate in Taiwan, um, it's not pervasive at all. Uh, and a lot of people prefer face to face um, uh, services, even though there's equivalent ones uh, existing in the digital realm. And we're, we're OK with that. Um, I mean, my own grandma, uh, 88 years old, um, has not used a ATM uh, in her life uh, and probably uh, she will prefer to remain that way. So it's not like we have a KPI of 100% of people using an ATM, right? Uh, but what we are saying is that people who do want to use it uh, need to have access to the digital equivalent of the services without having to go to the over-the-counter service that we can work on. Do you think that there'll be um, a digital voting system put in place in Taiwan, as for example, in Estonia, now they have uh, around 44% of people that are actually voting online. And I was yeah. seeing the uh -huh. uh, demographic mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. it's a lot of elderly people that are actually voting online today. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it actually well, has in, changed. In a sense, yeah, in a sense, we already do. The participatory budgeting system of many municipalities are voted online. The presidential hackathon uh, are voted online. There's many cases like this, but they have one commonality, uh, voting for things, not for people. So in the voting for people part, the elections, uh, that is entirely analog. And this is because in Taiwan, our counting process is um, a person taking out a piece of paper and people, anyone in the audience can just record it. So it's extremely transparent. You have YouTubers of all the different major uh, parties watching, like literally uh, each voting for person uh, ballot being counted. Now for electronic voting system to arrive to this degree of accountability is very difficult. Uh, but unless it does, we probably would not augment the voting for people part uh, with e-voting. But voting for things, well, that's fine because there's no exponential return. Okay, well, maybe we will be able to to get to a confident uh, 
uh, place also on the voting. We are actually uh, using voting also for people uh, in um, within the movement. Uh, so that's something we've uh, we've exploring, and we're exploring also uh, the voting on blockchain. On we we're now uh, looking on Monero, for example, uh, a system we've uh, mm -hmm. we've been exploring. So. Maybe there'll be. Yeah, I'm quite uh, familiar based. with those technologies. What I'm just saying is that um, to compare that with essentially YouTubers watching uh, each paper being counted is a very high bar for accountability. Yes, certainly is, certainly is. But we'll we'll work towards it, surely. Well, uh, thank you very much for mm -hmm. this chat. It was uh, great to. To speak you, to you again and uh, and keep up the great work you're doing there in Taiwan. I, I'm always uh, very interested to see any new article or new presentation you uh, give out. So I'll be very interested in two days' time to see the new plan for three years from now. So okay, thank you very excellent. much. Excellent. Yeah, let's keep in touch. And by the way, the final question: Would you prefer um, uh, for this video to be just published to the commons, uh, or do we have to make a transcript? Uh, well, what uh, I, uh, as you prefer. I, I mean, okay, I, maybe I'll just publish the video. It's easier. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, live Thank long you very and much. prosper. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.